Well, if you're just coming on board, the very first time, my name is Brett Rademacher, Harold Smith. He's the author of the articles on heathathasanear.com. And every week we do a discussion and we discuss articles he's written. Uh, this is a series that we're in right now, the Kingdom Mysteries. And um, what we do is we discuss what Harold's written. So that means he's wrote it, I've read it, we have a discussion. But the discussion is not the article. You have to read the article because a lot of times there's a lot of stuff in there we just simply can't cover within the time we do these. And then there's so much more information. There's links to Bible verses to substantiate what Harold's saying. There's word definitions, which are a huge part of reframing your understanding of Scripture. If you don't understand what words mean from a Hebraic perspective, from a Hebraic culture, then you're going to be lost. And a big part of these articles is trying to convey what they were really saying. It's probably the main theme that gets threaded through every single article. This is what they were trying to say. And, and what's really cool is as you start understanding what they're really trying to say, a lot of confusion goes away, a lot of questions get answered, and a lot of peripheral stuff that really doesn't matter just drops out of the view which is probably the most freeing thing that you can possibly imagine when you find out how much garbage is probably strangling your, your, your spiritual journey. And so please, oh, and then once in a while there's links to um, other things, like other articles or outside material, extracurricular stuff. So the biggest thing we can say to you is read the articles. Okay, so today's article uh, cloud of witnesses, and there's usually a one, two, sometimes three verses that Harold pins at the top to kind of start the conversation of what he's about to write on. Um, this one I, I've always found fascinating, and I, I paid more attention to it, you know, through our discussions, but it's in Mark 4, 11 uh, through 12, and it's actually quoting Isaiah 6, uh, 9 through 10, and it says, and Yeshua said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of Yahweh. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. They may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Boy, that's, that's, that's a hard one to just understand at face value, don't you think? It is. It, it, it completely contradicts uh, Christianity's approach to evangelization, i.e. their uh, complete obsession with saving the world. And... <laughs> And when well, and, and when you and when you look at these, it, what he's saying, and it's not, it didn't just pop up out of anywhere. I mean, he, he's quoting a, a verse out of the Tanakh. He's bringing the Tanakh, the Old Testament, well, what they call the Old Testament, forward and supporting it uh, and presenting it back to the disciples and. When you, when, like you said, when you just look at it at face value, you, you go, huh? <laughs> because we've always been taught that this is, this is the commission. The great commission is to go evangelize the world. Well, you know, but, but, but it's, it, 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 to me, you know, especially through, you know, our, our, our discussions and reading your articles, I think that the thing that, that really has to capture somebody's curiosity is, and, and I think I, you know, I, I think I get a general idea of how this has been twisted around in Christianity and it's in an unsaid manner. You know, a lot of things can occur from an unsaid perspective because of everything else that's wrapped around, you know, that thought or that process or the philosophy there, there, there comes kind of an attitude, right? Uh, for example, I was raised Catholic, and so during the masses, you would have this thing, stand, sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel. What the heck, you know? And, um, and, and you get to the place where you're conditioned 
to think kneeling by itself is more holy, right? Than sit, like sitting was unholy. And it's a conditioning process of just what you're surrounded by. Isn't that funny, right? And, um, but I, I throw that out there because there's probably some people that can relate to that in various degrees, not, maybe not in that particular flavor of religion. Uh, but the, the point being is, here we have uh, something that says, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, but may indeed hear, but not understand. Meaning he was intentionally hiding the meaning behind what he was saying by these parables, these stories, these examples that he was communicating. That's crazy. I mean, he's, he, people, people need to stop and really reflect on this. I, and this is, I think, the biggest problem with most people in Scripture, myself included. Everybody superficially reads this as if it's a novel or a book. And, and what you do is you go down and you deep dive into this, and then you cross-reference it, you know, uh, across this chasm of, you know, new covenant, old covenant. But you, you show that, you know, this co new old covenant thing is a, a misnomer in and of itself, and that everything going on in the Messianic writings, New Testament, is totally verifiable and anchored in the Old Testament, the Tanakh. So when you say, I, you're gonna, you, you have somebody that's supposedly here to save the word, the world, and yet he's speaking in confusing parables. You got a problem there. Real problem, because, because he goes on to say, lest hearing they, <laughs> they, they, they should turn, repent, and be forgiven. Yeah, so, so I mean, we could literally do a whole discussion going back and forth on that one verse. But let's dig. I, I, I have, that's a, such a fascinating verse, and I want to deep, deep dive on that a little bit. What do you mean? Why would he not want them to turn and be forgiven? Because we had this conversation a little while ago. It's fascinating. It's because we don't understand. We haven't been taught the power in his words the power that that emanates from light we're told in 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 first john that yahweh is light and we're told in john 17 that yeshua manifested that light uh the, the name of Yahweh, the nature of Yahweh, he manifested that light. Uh, and with that light comes judgment. In John 3, 19 through 21, he said, I didn't come to judge you, but there is a judgment that has come into the world, that light has come into the world and men love darkness more than they love the light and christianity usually stops right there but he goes on he says men love darkness more than they love to bring their deeds into the light for reproof to see if those deeds are wrought in yahweh or not and so he brings the judgment down to us as to what our response is to encountering light and if if you remember in past discussions we have likened uh, the life the source of life is yahovah and he in in first john he also said it also says he is that light if you can conceive the most brilliant the most pure the brightest light that you could could possibly imagine that's Yahweh and then you have darkness and you either are just like you're either in life or you're in death death is darkness you are you are in light or you are in darkness there's no middle ground on either one of those I, I, I think that's a really important point to make because I think people think first of all you have to realize there's no middle ground, right? If you don't, if you don't know the rules, if you don't know the boundaries, like for example, if you get to the place where you realize 
the Sabbath is a boundary, right? If honoring the Sabbath, Friday, what do they call it? Twilight to twilight. Right. I, I got a little app. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not having to wait around for a shofar. I'm not having to, looking for stars waiting for a shofar. I'm cheating, right? I, I got well, the little app. I've got a, I've got a big app. I'll just yeah. look out the window. <laughs> there you go. So I got a little app. You know, I'm more of a tech guy, so I got the app, right? I got the app. But, 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 but what I want to point out, it's a boundary, right? And if you understand there's, there's boundaries, like we give kids boundaries, right? If you look at any organization that's trying to, that operates functionally, the military, supposedly the government, uh, but, you know, if you look at a business, if you look at any organization, association, whatever, any entity that has to operate, they have a framework you know, rules, regulations, they're boundaries, right? And it's like, you know, this is what we do. This is what we don't do, right? And I think a lot of times this idea of freedom means, hey, we can do anything, right? Now, there's some, there's some truth to, yeah, you could potentially do anything. But where the, the break comes, the disconnect is, um, you may not be aware that there's consequences from you doing anything. So for example, if there's blessings and curses associated to walking in the 10 words, if there's blessings associated with honoring the Sabbath or honoring your mother and father, if, if there's blessings and curses that are directly associated to that, and you're not following the guidelines, there's a scripture for that. My people perish for lack of knowledge, right? If you don't have knowledge, understanding, it doesn't matter how nice your worship is. It doesn't matter how good looking your pastor is and how eloquent he's speaking. It doesn't matter if you feel good putting money in, helping orphans. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the coffee is great, the donuts are fresh, and the fellowship is, you know, uh, encouraging. None of that matters if the framework of your life has not been structured around what the creator put in place for you to live in. And, and, and we have to get, I think we have to get really real personally for ourselves, not me getting somebody else real, but we have to really look in the mirror and say, you know, if this is my life philosophy, number one, it, it should work for me in life. And number two, it better work for me when I'm dead, right? <laughs> I, always, I always say, you know, whatever your life philosophy is, make sure it works for you after you're dead. You know, that's a thought provoker. Um, so, so. I, I really want to challenge people to not take these scripture verses as just a sentence in a book, because once you realize how much is packed within them, and Harold, I think, has just been divinely led to help do that, uh, because once you get in here and you start seeing these things he's uncovered, you know, that Yahweh has shown him and revealed to him, you're going to have a completely different perspective on your life, how you live, what your focus is. Um, you know, we, we started off chatting before the discussion and I brought up the fact that, you know, my life is much more real time. It used to be like I would get something, <laughs> you know, they'd give me something and I'd say, okay, and I'd run with it. And then three months later, I'd check in. <laughs> you know, that's not a good way to do it because <laughs> by the time you're checking in, it's because you realize uh, where's the trail? <laughs> so, so here is, uh, I just think a, a very good scripture for challenging your belief system and finding out if it's really based on a, this philosophy that you, you know, that you purport to follow, or is it a manufactured condition that has been created in your life just by being assimilated and exposed to a you know, a culture and a mindset that's universal that's not really based on scripture. There's only, there's only one place where Yeshua pointed to distinctly and said that it's by the tradition of men that has been handed down to us that nullifies brings to none effect the power of the word of Yahweh in our lives. And uh, more distinctly, he says it brings to none effect the, the, the word of, of Yahweh. 
And if you, if you look at this phenomenon between light and darkness, that this is the judgment. You know, it's not we out here over yonder somewhere. It's right now. He's bringing this judgment into our lives right now by how we respond to these words that he speaks. And now, now that right there, stop right there. That was like a really power packed sentence. Stop and let's redirect, come back to what you just said. What the heck? So what happens is everybody thinks this judgment thing that's in the future is going on now by how we respond real time. Or it's some, or it's some apocalyptic event that's going to take place. Okay, okay. Now let's just take a look at it. If your future, if your current focus is on future events and that's how you live your life, rather than operating real time through being led by Yahweh and having this interactive relationship with how you respond to what he's doing in your life, leadings, you know, decisions, you know, more, where you're more, going. more succinctly, just, just the words on the page. Yeah. And, but, but if, but if, 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 if that's, what you're supposed to be doing versus, I mean, if this other part that you're doing, looking at the future events, when it's actually right now, real time, and you're not right now, real time, guess what? <laughs> Your whole life is being misdirected by a belief system that's based on a false doctrine, and you're not aware of it. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, it's probably why Yeshua said, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> it, it, it's because he was very aware that people do the things they do out of tradition, out of habit, out of peer pressure. And he was just making it very clear. He wasn't following the crowd just because somebody died. So, so then if, if he is, if Yahweh is the source of life and Yeshua said in John 14, 24, that the words that I speak are not mine, they're my father's. And the words carry judgment. The reason he's speaking in parables is because he understands that if he speaks these words of judgment, he's bringing people to a place of, of having to make a decision whether to move forward into the light or for whatever reason, to retreat back into the darkness rather than have their deeds be reproved. What he's doing is he's, he's really showing love to the multitude by not bringing them into a, a place of judgment because the latter place of, that, of where that person is, if they don't move forward into the light, they're gonna move back further deeper into darkness and the last place of that person is going to be worse off than he is if he just didn't understand i would think myself included i can't speak for you Harold, but i think anybody that's been on this journey has experienced what you just said oh if 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 you're involved with the spirit of life you're going to experience it you're, you're, you're going to you're going to have this experience of in and out and and, and you may be like me I didn't get what the heck was going on. I couldn't figure it out. I was like, going, what's going on? Why, why can't I move into this thing that I profess to believe in? It, 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 what is going on? What is keeping me from walking this thing out? And, and, I, I, and go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. It's fun. <laughs> well, it's, it's keeping the 10 words of the Father in every circumstance we find ourselves in. And in those circumstances where the, the 10 words, you just can't quite make them apply, you just have to say to the Father, I don't know what to do. And you wait on him to give you that understanding of how it, to move forward. It is such a different question. way to live because what you've done is you're putting kind of like a filter, a life filter on that everything has to come through and, and before you can operate in this, and you you have to make sure that that you're hearing rather than just doing, because doing can go anywhere, right? You know, right. love your neighbor 
if you don't understand what love for your neighbor really means, you may be going around and doing all these things that you think are love and yet have nothing to do with what that verse says. And, and Christianity has proposed, has, uh, may have brought that forward as a new commandment because that's, you know, they, Christianity is adept at taking one verse of scripture out of context and building an empirical doctrine on it uh, and, and then preaching it to the, to the masses. But where it says a new commandment I have given you that you love one another. And again, Christianity stops right there and they don't read the rest of the verse. Just as I have loved you. It's not that he's making a new brand spank, a new commandment and pulling it out of the air because that particular verse you can find in Leviticus, in the Tanakh. He was quoting the Tanakh, but what he was saying was, I'm showing you how to manifest that verse. So I am saying to you to keep the, the, the words that are in the Tanakh, but keep them in the manner in which I have shown you, I have lived among you and shown you how to do. He didn't, it wasn't a new brand spanking new, like you go down to the showroom, uh, auto showroom and buy a new car. He's saying this is, this is new from the, from the perspective, from the concept, from the way you approach it. It's not lovey-dovey, throw your arms around everybody and kiss them. It's being straightforward with them and speaking truth with each other the same way he showed us how to do it as he example for us. And it, the, the, the reason that he spent three and a half years with those disciples was to earn their trust. It wasn't to be all lovey-dovey with them. It's to show them how to live. And what they, what they saw, because he lived with them day and night for three and a half years, and what they saw is how he behaved in every circumstance that came upon him. All the words in the world are not going to cause somebody to change their life. What is going to cause someone to take that step into brilliance is to have a revelation from the Father. And that revelation only comes from, a, from some external source where they can see what something's going on that's apart from what I've experienced or what I'm used to or, or what I know. When you, when you get this information, the first time Yahweh speaks to you, will change you for the rest of your life. And if you've never had that happen, that to me is like one of the anchor points. The first time he like literally speaks into your spirit, that's it. You'll never forget it. You'll always remember it. You'll know what he said. And uh, what's been fascinating to me is he can say something in like just a few words that could just instantly change you your attitude your perspective your belief system i mean like nothing else like no order from a cop no directive from a you know if you're in the military your mom your dad your boss nothing can get your attention like your creator speaking into your spirit nothing. well and that's because he is the word and the word contains the power to do that i was talking with a fella uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, and he was he was had been reading these articles, and, and he's he's trying to figure out. Um, he was reading uh, the article about retaining sin, and he was saying, "Well, how does that work? What are the mechanics like? How do I make that?" And he's he's approaching it purely from a logical reasoning. A what, what I call a principle point of view, right? He's trying to find out what the principle is and how to utilize it. Exactly. And, and I told him, I said, none of that is going to happen if you don't first hear the voice of the Father. And, and I, I think this is an amazing point to bring up, Harold, because 
I think that's what most people are living. They're living this principle based religion. So it's like, you know, it, you know, I never knew you. Yes, you heal people. Yes, you cast out demons, but I never knew you. It's basically they learn principles or they learn concepts or whatever. You know, the word of faith, it's very famous for, you know, I'm going to think up what I want and because I'm a son of God. I can manifest that by proclaiming it out into the universe. And, you know, this, this has to come back to me because I have spoken it to being because I'm a child of God. That's such a twisted version of scripture. It's mind blowing. But, it is. But, it is. But. But. It works. You can do that. I did that. And I know it works. The problem being, <laughs> that's all in darkness. It, it's manipulating principles out of your desire to be your own God, if you want to know the truth. See, I, I don't think we realize as human beings, everybody has been, you know, that little terrible too. Now, some more terrible than others. I have eight kids. Okay, everybody knows that somewhere around two or three, most kids start getting stubborn as all get out because they start realizing they have, what, a free will. You know, I want to do it. I don't want to do it. And so you spend the next... <laughs> I've got one that's 31 years old. That's in that state. <laughs> yeah. so, so, but you, you've got this, this period of time, 16 years, 30 years, whatever, where, where you're, you're trying to walk your, your children through this process of learning that they're not their own God. Well, hello, guess what? We're just bigger versions of that. We may, you know that saying, oh, big boys toys, you know, just because the gun's bigger or the, 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 the tricycle has a motor on it. Hey, they're, they're still toys. They're just boys with bigger toys. So it's the same thing. We, we seem to think because we, we've gotten older, we have money, we, we can make our own decisions. We don't realize, how, we do not realize, because I know this, because I, I'm so evaluated, you really have to do this as a business person, because you're so in charge, so, so to speak, of your decisions. But you start, you, 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 you cannot believe when you really analyze it, how much you are your own God. Bottom line, it is the condition of man. It's the condition of man. Whether you are aware of it or not, you are your own God. And the journey you're going through is to get cut through the reality of that garbage and realize, A, you're not, and B, you know, once you realize that, well, then how do you live? <laughs> and then that's what these words are, are, are designed to do. They, they are instructions. The 10 words of the Father uh, found in Exodus 20, 1 through 17, are instructions on how to remain in the brilliance of his light without being consumed. Remember, because what light does is it consumes darkness. It causes it to dissipate. And if you don't want to dissipate, <laughs> being scattered out all over the place, you 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 need to follow these words and these words will keep you in it because with what the what the 10 words do is they are instructions on how to remain in the nature of the father you know we read where abraham in, in genesis 26 5 the reason that yahweh chose abraham was because he, he first obeyed his voice. He had to hear his voice. But then he kept his words, his statutes, his commandments, his statutes, his ordinances, his laws. And this was 430 years before they were given at Sinai. How did he do that? It's because he, he spent time with, his, with the Father and he learned his nature. He first had to hear his voice. We have to spend time with him and listen for his voice. And I promise you, he wants you to hear his voice more than you do. But if we do it, if we if we if we exercise that that diminishing of ourselves and listening to his voice, and keeping his ten words we're going to find he will speak to us. Uh, 
in the beginning with me, like you said, it was just a couple of words. Uh, but the more I spent time with him, the more that conversation grew because I, I began to understand his nature. I began to understand where he was coming from um, to a large degree. I mean, it's something I'm still learning, but it's, but it, it becomes, uh, it becomes like a habit. It's, it's just something that you. Oh, well, yeah. And I'm going to add one point to that and then we can, we can actually start talking about the article. I just okay. want to point out, we just spent 30 minutes going back on two scripture verses. That's, that's what I'm saying. We can really have a long discussion about one little paragraph in one of your articles. But, the, um, but, but what I want to have everybody just really anchor in is um, this place where you have to come to where you realize you don't really know as much as you think you do. Amen. You know? And, and um, I, I, I've gotten literally to the place and I, it started happening over a period of time and I would check in with my wife and, and see if it was happening to her. And it was as well. But as, as we walked along this journey, it's like you get to the place where all this outside extracurricular noise, it could be music, it could be podcasts or people talking, it could be movies, it could be books, news, social media. But it's almost like this stuff starts becoming, I don't want to sound too, spiritually violating. Uh, you know, it, it, it comes to where, you know, it's just, it's conflicting with, you know, your spirit. It's conflicting with what you know. And you have to get to a place where you just shut it down, you know, because, because you're going to have this constant battle in, in your mind and your spirit because this information does affect you, right? We're seeing a world affected by information and we're seeing the craziness of it right now in the news globally it's just nuts why because information's going out it's making people crazy because it's either click uh, uh, you know conflicting with their belief system or the reality and they're saying none of this is making sense Ugh. and 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 the key thing we have to understand is that's powerful it's powerful in the sense that that's a reality that information can cause you to be confused it can cause you to be impotent in the sense of not being able to take action. It can cause you to go down the wrong track. And so you be, better be very careful and clear what you're listening to in these days because those outside channels are going to get noisier and they're going to get more confusing, not less. We're in the age of overwhelming amount of information. I have to deal with it in my business. And, I, and I've gotten to the point where I have to take concentrated periods of time and completely disconnect from all this stuff going around me in order to be able to hear clearly. So, uh, okay, is, clap. Okay, what's that? This is, this is why we need a standard to measure all of this stuff by. Yes. And in Revelation 19.10, the latter portion, portion of that verse, it says that the, the testimony of the life of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy and if you look at the hebrew word for prophecy it's nava and nava means the spoken oracles of yahweh so if we take that definition and we plug it into that verse we see that the testimony of the life of yeshua is or are the spoken oracles of Yahweh. So if we, all of this stuff that's coming at us and bombarding us, we have to take all of that information and we, we measure it against the life of Yeshua that's exampled before us in the four gospels. Now, if we don't understand his life, if we're not familiar with his life, and I'm not just talking about the healings and the miracles, I'm talking about what he said, how he said it, how he manifested it. If you're not familiar with that, you're going to miss it because his life is that standard, that benchmark by which we measure everything. And that includes other words of scripture, as we're seeing in this article about a cloud of witnesses. Uh, we look at, at what is 
given to us in, in Acts 1, 9 through 11, where it says that uh, when, uh, when he had said these things, uh, as they were looking, uh, uh, looking on, he was lifted up uh, in a cloud. A cloud received him out of, the, um, uh, out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white uh, clothes and said, men of, Galilee, why do you, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Uh, this Yeshua who was taken up uh, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Well, <laughs> when I was in Israel, I stood, they've got a little place marked off uh, where supposedly this is the spot where he was taken up into heaven. They call it the ascension, although the ascension is never, it, that word never appears in scripture. And in this spot, there are two, what they say are, and, and what kind of looks like, two footprints <laughs> where he was standing <laughs> and they got it roped off and you know they make a big deal out of it and uh uh i, I and, and, and who and whose footprints might these be well they are ascribing them to this jesus okay that, that this is talking so about. so like these are like <laughs> Holy footprints, then. Holy footprints. You have to understand, in Israel, all of the religious sites, quote, religious sites, are they're all uh, controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, so their whole presentation and the whole formation of them, you know, they tell this story uh, and, and they present it from the Catholic point of view. Now, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, okay, that's really, stop a second, stop a second. Okay, you brought up a big question in my head. It's a little bit off target, but I, I, I would think some other people would have this question too. Um, so, so are you saying like the Israel uh, Bureau of Tourism or whatever you call it, of, of ancient relics, they get their narrative on Christian, you know, relatable areas in the country that get the narrative from the Catholic church. And that's, that's what they're doing. Is that what you mean? Nobody owns land in Israel, right? The, the nation of Israel owns everything. Right. What they do is they give out a hundred year leases on particular spots of interest that, that the Catholics use to raise money from. Um, the, it, it, like, is there a place, it, it, you know, is there an example of a place in mind or just in general? Uh, the, um, the church of the Basilica where, okay, just, all right, cool. Where, you know, uh, Yeshua was born in a cave with a stall of animals. I mean, you know, they, they so, so, so what I wanted to point out is what you're basically, what you're basically saying is even within Israel, the narrative is controlled by outside influences to, to align up with the belief system that was put in place, you know, 300 years after Yeshua, or, you know, and has morphed along the way. But, but basically, it's a very controlled narrative. I, you know, I went to the tomb of, of um, uh, Jesus where he was resurrected and they've got little signs that pointed the way and you go up to the tomb where Jesus was resurrected and you go in, it's a little, it's just a, a hole in the side of, of, a, of a rock and, you know, it's, it's all kind of carved out and everything. And they've got this huge stone that, you know, is rolled back from the entrance and, I kind of stepped, I looked in and kind of stepped back and one of the um, uh, guides was standing there. And I asked him, I said, so this is really the place where, where Jesus was resurrected? He said, no. He said, <laughs> he said, this is just, uh, uh, 
this is just kind of, I mean, these, these tombs are all over Israel. I mean, this is how they. So basically it was, Hey, that one looks good. Exactly. And okay, you know, I, 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 I want to, I, I, have you ever done a word study on um, the word relic or icon? Um, uh, not off the top of my head. No. Okay. All right. The reason why I bring that up is it ties in with what you're saying, but and especially this is propagated by the Catholic churches. Um, it, if you get into all the relics and icons that the Catholic church, you know, has possession of, uh, or is connected to Shroud of Turin, for example, uh, is there's there's these things. Now, whether they're real or not, like this cave being, you know, an actual cave Jesus was was born in, as obviously totally oh, uh, res resurrected. Resurrected and born in. Well, the manger, we had the main the manger thing too. So born in, whether it was the manger he was born in or the cave that he was buried in or or whatever these are, what what's happened is when you look at the history of relics and icons, they're things that over a period of time uh, are believed to have magical powers, right? So like, this is, his, I believe historically true, I've read it a number of places, for example, Adolf Hitler, Hitler was trying to get the spear that pierced Jesus, and that was one of his big quests uh, globally because he believed that would give him the power to rule the world. And that's obviously psychotic, but but the, the thing to keep in mind is just like your belief systems are developed over this time that you just come into full immersion without really having a framework to evaluate them. It's the same thing with all these little stories and these, these pieces of whether they're actual uh, connected to these historical figures or biblical figures is always up to question, but they, they literally have power. And I remember, you know, Keep my eyes raised Catholic. I was a terrible Catholic, by the way. I, I didn't drink the Kool Aid. So it, it was not very hard for me to walk away from that. But I can tell you stories growing up of these people that went to Israel or they went to Rome and, or these holy places where, you know, permanent, you know, clouds are appearing and voices hearing. Man, I tell you what, they're always coming back with their little relics, their little piece of something, their little water. And, well, and, and, and that's that's what makes these sites so valuable is there's a ton of money that flows through these things. I remember uh, when I first went to Israel, I went to a, with a guy who was uh, thought he had found Jacob's well. And he was going to bottle water out of Jacob's well and go sell it. He wasn't a Roman Catholic, but, you know, he still had the, um, the uh, capitalistic uh, viewpoint toward it. And, I heard the same story from somebody. <laughs> and, well, what we discovered was is that Jacob had many wells. Abraham built many wells, and and uh, Isaac inherited them, and then he built even more wells. And so Jacob inherited all these wells, and then he built more. I mean, they're all over the country. Uh, and and, and, and I, 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 I had a deep dive on this because I had somebody pitch me asking me if I wanted to market water from Jacob's well. And, and, and there's this whole, it's holier water thing, right? People forget is that there are 18 civilizations built on top of one another in Israel. That thing has been there for a long time. And you, you know, to try to make distinctions between when one civilization quit and another started is is impossible. Uh, and so, to try to say, you know, for for a fact, this is the deal. It's it's an impossibility. So this cloud of witness thing, you know, everybody's seen, you know, arts of this, you know, if I said to somebody, hey, what's the cloud of witnesses, right? You know, I know what the image would pop into my mind that I had. It was a bunch of guys in robes looking down at me, you know, either like going, dude, uh, when are you going to get your act together? Or, oh, you know, hey, you're doing all right. You know, this kind of thing where it's like, it's like a coliseum and you got this cloud of witnesses in a ring watching you and you're out there doing your thing. And, you know, are you going to make it? Are you going to cut it? That, I think, is the general perception that, that is pervade in Christianity, right? And so... You have to, you have to, you, 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 correct. And, and so to find the 
truth of these words, you got to do, like you said, a deep dive into the original words. What do they mean? And, and when I started doing that, uh, I began to see that uh, I didn't do it on my own. The Father began to lead me down this, this path. And, and what I discovered was that all of the, the words that are used in that verse that, that I uh, quoted out of Acts 1, the, the word lifted up, went up, gazing up, taken up. If you get down, there's a different Greek word for each one of those two word uh, illustrations. And if you look at each one of those Greek words, there is no direction given in their definitions. They, they all mean something totally different from one another. And, but yet when they get to our English, that just that means up. You know, no, up. no, no. So, so you, you get down a little further and, and you basically say it's an interdimensional thing. It's the same thing as when um, Paul <clears throat> talked about um, uh, that he was taken up or caught up into the third heaven. Uh, the, the two English words caught up, it's the same Greek word. It, it's harpazo. And what it means is to seize, to carry off, um, to, to be taken by force, um, uh, to snatch out or away again non-directional this is and it's the same greek word um that's that's used um talking about um philip when he was when he was caught away so so number one and, and you get more detail with links to word definitions and things. so number one we've, we've got this thing about caught up it's, it has nothing to do with going in the sky it has to be with you know, being here and then not being here. It's, 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 it's the same idea as when Yeshua, after the resurrection, he, it says he appeared to his disciples. It doesn't say he, he wafted in through the door or came in through the walls. In fact, it says the disciples were in this room with all the doors and windows locked because they were afraid the Pharisees were going to come and get them. So it made, it made it very clear it was an interdimensional thing because what we're talking about here is a spiritual realm of dimensions. We're not talking about um, shooting off in the atmosphere. And I've seen that dimension. I, yeah. have, I have experienced that dimension. When I had my second heart attack, I was uh, three days and three nights in my room, uh, in my flat in, in Israel. I couldn't go anywhere. And in those three days, Yeshua was there in the room with me. And I, it was, I was looking into another dimension at one point. And then he was as real as, as you are standing there with me. But it, there were other times that it was clear that I was I was perceiving something in a in another dimension uh, to see him, and and it was I don't like to use that word dimension because everybody thinks of Star Cause, Trek because it means know. something to different people, right? It means something different. Beam me up, Scotty. But that's not what I'm talking about. It's it's a it's 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 stepping out of one realm into another. And um, so, when we okay, so so the, this caught up thing, you, you've shown that that has a different meaning in reality. Let, let's talk about the cloud of witnesses, because the cloud of witnesses you show here with the word definitions and showing how that related word is used in the Old Testament, that means something different, cloud of witnesses. What about that? Well, um, <clears throat> Again, if we go back to the Tanakh, where it talks about that, you know, they, a cloud guided them by day and a, and a, and a fire by night, um, the, the, the word uh, translated as the English cloud in Exodus uh, 13.21 comes from the Hebrew word 
Anon and is used really more of a fog than it is of a shape of a cloud that we would think, you know, we'd see in, in the sky. Um, and, uh, and then it's also used in Ezekiel 38, 9, uh, talking about a contingent of people as a covering for the land. And then the Hebrew author of, uh, of uh, the book of Hebrews carries forward this, it's a Hebrew simile with the usage, usage of the Greek uh, word nephos in reference to a cloud of witnesses uh, in Hebrews 12.1, meaning a large, dense multitude of throng. So when Yeshua left that day, there was an assemblage of the faithful in observance of the event. Some say it was up to 500 people. But his leaving was merely a, um, a continuation of the, of the way he appeared um, in the room mentioned uh, before out of, uh, before the disciples to where he was out of one dimension into another witnessed by those presence. It's the same type of occurrence that is recorded as having happened on Shavuot where the breath of life came upon the 120 and, and uh, Shavuot has been renamed as the English Pentecost. Um, Although this event had, you know, more fanfare, there was, there was more stuff going on, uh, but it was the same type of um, distribution of the, of the breath of life coming out of one dimension and then filling another dimension in, in the hearts of those who were there. Um, and Okay, because that, that's where heaven moved, right? So... But let's, before you go there, let me, before you tap into that to finish this up and talking about where heaven is now and, and what transpired to get it there, uh, because there's, there's three components in this article. So basically what you're saying, there was a group of people, large group of people, this cloud of witnesses, and that Yeshua appeared and then disappeared dimensionally, not shooting up to the clouds. It, it, a different realm. Right. He, he, he stepped out of the dimension, uh, the physical dimension that he was in. And remember, he was resurrected now. He had a, he had a, 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 a translated uh, body. It, it, was, it was a body, but it was, it was different. And so when he stepped out of this realm of, of physicality, into the realm of those gathered. He, he, he was caught away into a cloud of witnesses. And, and scripture does not say his return uh, would be exactly as he went. It says in the manner, meaning the same way, in similar fashion as we saw uh, with with uh, with uh, those those guys in, in the room, it, 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 so what does that mean in like manner? It, it, I mean, really, is it such a stretch of the imagination to think that the cloud that took Yeshua out of sight could possibly just be in accordance with all of those? Um, definitions, a cloud of witnesses, those who have embraced his life to become his body. Now, what do you mean by that? The cloud of witnesses that were there were the ones who had been following him, who mm -hmm. had embraced his life. And so when he stepped out of this dimension of reality, he stepped into who those disciples were. What happened with him was a, it was a precursor um, uh, you know, him, him breathing into the disciples when he first appeared to him and then, and then stepping into the realm of the cloud of witnesses, 
uh, it was it was a precursor, and, and and those those things had to be laid so that the breath of life could could be breathed on the 120 at Shavuot. Now, now you um you you touch base on this on a number of articles, some in more depth, but you mention it here, and I think it helps tie this article together. Is you know this cloud of witnesses, heavens looked at some ethereal above place. And yet what you've done in your articles is show that um, heaven is much different than what we think it is. The Hebraic perspective is it's not a place, it's something else. What is it and where is it at? Heaven is, is a state of being. The, the scriptures tell us that Yahweh... I know, I know hell is a state of being, at least for me. It's been in the past a few times, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole nother discussion. Whole nother discussion. <laughs> but uh, uh, the scripture tells us that heaven is God is Yahweh's throne. Y Yeshua quoted that verse, that passage from the Tanakh. Uh, he he supported it. Heaven is Yahweh's throne. So wherever Yahweh's throne is, there is heaven. Correct. Well, what happened on Shavuot was that Yahweh. His he changed his residency. Uh, his now, now he didn't do this. This was not an impulsive thing, decision, right? This was something that was from the original blueprint. This was the plan and purpose of Yahweh from 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 the the moment that Adam disobeyed and that separation had to occur. Remember, light and darkness cannot abide in the same space at the same time. So when, when Adam disobeyed, he corrupted the blood because he brought darkness into it. And, and because they can't abide in the same space, there had to be a separation. And from and, that and, moment, from that moment, Yahweh's plan and purpose for his family, remember Adam was the first Hebrew, not the first of mankind. And uh, his plan and purpose for his family from the lineage of Adam and Chava uh, was to bring life out of darkness, to 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 bring life out of death, because where they when when that separation happened, they became like everybody else in the world. They they be, they were in a place of death because anything yeah. anything apart from life is death. Go ahead. Well, I I, I have a I have a just a, a, a process that I found as I go through life, it, it seems to be a pattern. And what, what happens is I have a tendency to, to come into things that are very complex, but my mind doesn't necessarily think complex, but you have to figure out the complex in order to understand it. And then once you understand it, the next thing is how to simplify it, right? So if you ask somebody, you know, what's the purpose of the Bible? What does it mean? You know, what's it about? You, you know, especially with the clarity of, of, of so many of your articles, in a nutshell, you know, if you look at scriptures, it, it, it's this simple. It's like, here's what I really intended. You guys screwed up. Here's my plan to fix it. And then here's somebody that's going to show you how it's done. So, so you have an example, <laughs> right? right. I, I mean, it, it's that simple. And, and I think... One of the things that I've really noticed in my life, and I want to encourage everybody, is initially you're, you're getting this information from Harald, and it's so different than what you've heard or been taught. And, it, it, and it's going to take maybe some weeks or some months. I remember I would have to stop reading your article in the middle, and sometimes it would take me two or three weeks to read one article. Not that I was trying to read it the whole time, but I'd come in and out of it because I was at that place where I was pondering a lot of the stuff. And, and so I had to like swish it around, you know, regurgitate it. And, and, and really, you know, they talk chewing. Uh, uh, but, but I had to literally um, process that because it was based on, uh, this is what I'm going through, that's what I'm thinking about, how does it connect with all these other things, you know, rewiring all the connections because they have different meanings as new information comes in. And, what happens in all this initially it might be a little overwhelming might be a little confusing you might have to pause think things through walk them out talk them out pray about them whatever your process is but i think what will happen over time 
And what I've seen with my wife and I and our family is things get a lot clearer and they get a lot more simple. So if we're looking at the fact that heaven is Yahweh's throne, when Shavuot occurred, he, he moved his dwelling place. He, Yahweh moved within the hearts of men, fulfilling the, the scripture we find in, in Jeremiah 33, 31 through 33, where it says this, this, this restored covenant will be within the hearts of men. And what was, what was before was written on tablets of stone will now be written on their hearts. But they're still the same words. Uh, and, and, and so he has moved from the heavenlies that into the hearts of men. And when his throne moved, heaven moved with him. And Yeshua reinforces this in uh, Luke 17, 20 and 21, where he says, he quotes it, he says, the kingdom of Yahweh does not come by observation. It's not something you can see out in the physical. It's within or among the faithful. Now, I don't call them believers because Christianity has so uh, corrupted that word because what we're looking at with these people are the faithful, those who are faithful to, have, to keep Yahweh's words in the manner of example that Yeshua showed us how to live. There. Followers of the way, the way of the Nazarene. That's it. That's it. And, and you, know, um, you know, as we're winding down here, I, I, you know, Carl and I, we talk about this, but one of the biggest things I hope we do here is we um, uh, disrupt your reality <laughs> with intelligently, right? It, it, it's, not, it's not manipulation. It's not designed to be uh, coercive. Nobody's trying to get money out of you. You know, it, it's just a discussion. But what we want you to do really is just rethink your belief systems based on what scripture is actually saying based on what you've just <laughs> assimilated through osmosis or have, uh, you know, through the years co-opted, you know, all these different pieces and assembled a belief system that you think works. <laughs> Cause we all do that, right? It's like, we're trying to figure out our path here. So like, you know, this works for me, that works for me, this works for me. Okay. That may work for you, but is that really how it's supposed to work? <laughs> so uh, give it some thought, but thanks for, for being on here. Great job, Harold. And